Hey, Hiro, uh, we've got a really cool uh, session or episode to do today. Yeah. Um, but I want to talk to you. You, you've, you've been around the clock a bit, man. How many Shi'i do you think you've done in your life? <laughs> a lot. It's like I can't really. I mean, a lot, mate. A lot. Heaps. <laughs> a lot. Heaps and heaps. Now, here's the question. This is a segue question, right? And this is what today's episode is about. What did you do to get yourself? With the mental edge to get, what did you do to get the mental edge over your over your opponents during your competitive career, man? Mental edge. Yeah. What the hell are I talking about? <laughs> <laughs> the mental edge. You don't know about the mental edge? No. You didn't hear this? What is it? Uh, I don't look, think everyone it. knows about it, mate. Oh, uh, look. Well, we're about to let the cow out of the bag and tell everybody what this is. And to yeah, do that, please. we have a bit of a special guest today, Hiro, as you know. We've got a, a Dr. Takuya Hayakawa uh, coming onto the show today. Takuya-san is 37 years old and has practiced kendo for seven years. Right, he has right. third down. Yeah. And he uh, got his... Pardon me. Yeah, that is quick. That is quick. That is quick, mate. Uh, yeah. He got his... That's the mental edge, you see. He got his doctorate from Keio University or the Japan Institute of Sports Sciences. Uh, and he practiced kendo at the University of Tennessee Kendo Club uh, and is right, now based right. in Kanagawa, Japan. He, uh, he specializes in mental skills training, optimal practice environments, learner-centered coaching, which is all my, uh, my sort of thing as well, and self-regulated learning uh, and uses that research uh, to promote mental training for optimal kendo performance. Takuya-san, oh or Dr. Takuya, is with us now, and we'll just bring Gosh. him in. Welcome, Dr. Welcome. Welcome, Dr. Hayakawa-sensei. Thank you very much <laughs> so for your much time, for mate. Me. It's great to have you. What, we've, uh, what we're talking about, as you know, Takuya-san, is, is, is getting that mental edge, right? Um, and what, what I was mm -hmm. hoping, or we were hoping you could do, is talk a little bit about your research and your application of your research to kendo training. Okay, yeah. so actually I studied kendo when I uh, when I was in US, not in Japan, so which is maybe unique. So <laughs> there was a fortunate that I met uh, my kendo sensei at uh, Knoxville, Tennessee. So that's the first time I, I officially start practicing kendo, but uh, I, I've already had uh, many backgrounds of both psychology and mental training. So I was thinking that, oh, this is a good time to use that uh, mental skill to myself. So I've used a lot of mental training strategies. So like I use goal setting, imagery, and some of the uh, training for using the focus. To me, the focus is maybe one of the best practice to make it sharpen my sense of kendo, how uh, the uh, uh, during the practice or uh, like matches, we are wondering my mind. Then oftentimes we lose focus uh, for some reason. But uh, using those kind of techniques is very helpful for me to stay focused so that I can uh, do my best performance. Yeah, for sure. So you you mentioned a couple of things that you said goal setting. Uh, in imagery, I think um, there'd be quite a few people who are familiar with with goal setting, although we can cover that in a future episode if there's interest in it. Imagery is something mm -hmm. I think you're going to talk about just a little bit later. Um, but you mentioned focus and attention, right? And that's a really important thing uh, to, to get the mental edge when you're talking about either Kendo or any other athlete for that for that matter, uh, about mm -hmm. attention and, and where to put your focus. Look, the night if I come up with this model, so there are uh, two different dimensions. One is uh, external to internal. The other one is broad to narrow. So our attention can be categorized to one of them while we are doing kendo. The external narrow, which is the best uh, area for performance. Like uh, our attention is uh, go outside from uh, uh, from body, then the target is very narrow. So the, it says reacting or executing a skill or aiming a target. The narrow external, zooming in, 
um, mm -hmm. on what's going on out there. So that might be your strategy, uh, to, like, for example, to strike the banakote when the person dips just before they strike uh, or, you know, focusing on their timing or something like that. Broad uh, internal is like more like uh, assessing or analyzing. So what happened to yourself? Like the the models uh, actually say the planning strategies or making decisions or analyzing information. So the big picture, mm -hmm. but in here, what how we uh, how we react, and that might be, for example. Uh, noticing that just before they strike, they, they drop their kensen or the certain um, habit that they have before they make an attack and therefore what we do in response to that. Narrow internal is more like maybe before the matches or practice, you were thinking like, so how you move your body or how you uh, move your shinai or something which is what we're going to be talking about a little bit more later, I think, is about how we can calm those nerves and regulate uh, how we feel. If we get a little bit too nervous, how can we shift uh, appropriately into the right zone? Broad external, right? So we've got this mm -hmm. sort of idea that uh, we're looking out there um, mm -hmm. in those in that big put that big picture. So for example, what what sort of position you are in the Shiaijo, you know, are you up against the line or are you on the X? Uh, mm -hmm. you know, those sorts of things. And and you and I think it's fair to say if you watch a, a slightly uh, less experienced Shiaisha in the Shiaijo during a competition, mm -hmm. their potential to step out is much greater than a more experienced person, right? Because their focus isn't uh, able to switch between uh, what's going on out there and what's going on in here or, or in here, right? So that exactly. when you see um, more more experienced people, they, they know where they are uh, and their focus can be easily switched from that broad external uh, and then mm -hmm. switching accordingly. Broad external? You have to position yourself uh, in Shi'ai, for example. You have to position yourself in for your advantage, right? You know, you you really have to have a dark, not dark, but you don't want to have sunshine coming in because, and then you know, you can't really see your opponent, right? But that was happening when I was uh, doing this Shi'ai. So you had, I had to make sure I am standing in front of the, you know, uh, sunshine coming through. So yeah. I don't have to look at directly, but they are looking at directly. My opponent is, so they can't see me technically. <laughs> yeah. So it's that kind of thing. I was thinking about that when you talk about broad external. That's a really good example of of acknowledging what's going on in the right. in the environment out there, and what your strategy should be. So it's almost a bit of an external, narrow, you know, uh, a big picture out there, but sort of zooming in on what am I going to do uh, to get to get that edge and that's a strategic thing at right. the same time of knowing where you are in the shiajo and looking at how that sunshine that glare might impact his decisions or what sort of waza he's going to do or where does you know does he even notice that he's got the sun in his eyes now right <laughs> yeah. yeah one thing that we can sort of really unpack here is how do we do this how do we make ourselves uh, ready and give ourselves some mental edge or prepare ourselves to have the mental edge uh, with this sort of framework in mind, right? To make it happen or to get into the mental edge, the Kenshi uh, need to decide maybe one thing you should do really pay attention to or really focus on it so that they can shift to external focus, like focusing on yourself, like I should uh, do this, or I should focus on this technique, or I should uh, focus on this part of my, my body so that I can move smoothly or something. Find out something to pay attention to, to do the, your best performance. You know, you, I know being your student for many, many years, many, many years ago, um, Kakari Geko was a, a, a big part of what we used to do do you think that the kakari geko training is is helpful in getting people sort of on autopilot so they can execute techniques without thinking about them too much so that they can focus on the uh the broader 
external stuff or the strategic stuff or, or, or anything like that? I think it's kakari uh, geiko uh, is practical practice, like as you say, autopilot. You just go when you need to, right? So it is really great training method. And I think it's mental preparation as well. If you do a lot of kakari geiko and you will yeah. think like, oh, you, know, you feel confident. And I did a lot of kakari geiko, you know. I can't, yeah. you know, I don't think I'm going to lose that easily. Kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know about adult practitioners, or, you know. Does it work for equally to adult practitioners? I don't really know about that. My father did a kakari geiko against Miyazaki, because <laughs> Miyazaki is a man who did that when he yeah, was yeah. around sixty. <laughs> <laughs> and my dad, my father was going, I don't think I should be doing that. <laughs> sure, if you've got comments out there about uh, what age people should be doing kakari geiko to, mm. or, or if you are um, over, what was it, sixty? If you're over the age of sixty and still doing kakari geiko, <laughs> let us know down. In the comments below but you're absolutely right you know like that the the effect or the outcome of doing lots of kakari geiko before a, a big event in terms of the confidence that you can take yeah. away from that uh, and knowing that you've worked hard and that's the thing confidence is earned right you don't just uh just turn up and go oh i can i can do this that's that's more ego than it is confidence so confidence is earned through kakari geiko uh especially right um, I'll see if I can make these slides available in a Google folder for viewers if they want to have a look at these. But this first one here is a focus plan, right? And this is what I've used for my own competition uh, experience uh, at, at uh, the last six world champs. Uh, and I start to use it now with my athletes and the New Zealand team as coach as well. But simply going through and planning deliberately about what scenario or situation might arise to take your focus and leave it stuck in the wrong area, right? Leave it stuck on the external broad when we really need to be focusing on the uh, on more narrow things or vice versa, getting stuck on how I feel, the nerves and being very narrow and internal and ignoring whereabouts we're standing in the shiaijo or missing cues from our opponents, dipping their, their kenten before they strike. So what this requires is for a coach and an athlete or just the athlete, him or herself, to go through and understand when those thoughts and feelings uh, arise during the day, maybe the day before, the week before, the morning of the competition, and in between uh, shiai, you know, because sometimes, if, especially if you're doing well in a shiai, the, the event can go the whole day, right? You, you, you do your first fight at 10 o'clock in the morning and you're not back on the floor until 12 and then again at 1.30 and so on, right? So what are the moments in time and how can we plan for those right and really unpack what the description is of how we should be feeling or how we want to be feeling and the key thing here for me in my experience and in, in, is those trigger words or those cue words right and they're so so important when you think about the impact because we don't want to have to try and remember this this whole form that we fill out uh it's very very handy to have this tucked in a piece of paper tucked into your nafra music gang uh, so you can read it during the day. This isn't a one-time thing. This is a case of, of doing the planning long before the event uh, comes up and thinking really purposefully about what it is that you're feeling and how you're going to get through it. The other thing that I thought would be helpful here is the refocus plan, and this is a, a exactly what I've used in the past. So the previous one was about the moments during the day that we might need to focus or, or shift our attention. This one is a lot more sort of in in action, and I found this so important, uh, so so uh, helpful, um, especially in moments where I lost an ipong early in the match. So these are coming from real life examples, right? Or <laughs> Getting a bad call from the shimpan. How many of us have had that happen, right? Uh, or feeling overly nervous uh, before you go into the shiaijo, even while you're still in the shiaijo. And so the idea is that we, again, we use those trigger words or phrases to get us 
back into the flow and getting us focusing in the right area. Being able to shift back into the to the to the quadrant or to the area that we know we need to be, and that's focusing on what the sh uh, the other person's doing, or how much time is left on the clock, or what their strategy is, and what we need to do. We're constantly moving around that graph, and if we can use these trigger words to bring us back into line and brush off, as I've used it there, brush it off and move forward. It, it makes a massive difference to where we put our attention and therefore maintaining the mental edge. Oh, sure, totally. <laughs> I mean, the focus brain is very helpful to stuck on what you need to do. So like uh, like your example is perfect. Like, so when you get the ippon, oftentimes, oh, I got an ippon, or what should I do? Or even in the team match, so I have to think about uh, how many points I, I have to keep or I have to take it back or something. So you have to uh, quickly go back to the best focus state so that focus plan or focus key is very helpful. Imagery is a really good uh, strategy, especially uh, when you learn something new skills. So it's uh, right now we have a lot of chances to see yourself like thinking video, seeing yourself is the very uh, good way to learn how you move your body. Then watching the video is a one good example to practice your imagery. But also uh, without uh, you uh, seeing uh, watching the video, you can still practice uh, your uh, body uh, movement in your mind. Yeah, absolutely. I I have some um uh some resources that I think would be rather helpful for the viewers. So we'll link those in the description down below uh, in the next in the next wee while, uh, where you can click through and actually get a script um, that I've used in the past. So you can you can have someone that read that out to you, or you can read it to yourself. Thank you so much to doc, uh, Dr. Takuya Hayakawa for joining us today uh, and for helping us to understand what it takes to get the mental edge in your kendo. Hiro, are you a little bit more clear on what mental edge means now, mate? We probably have to go two more class or lessons, maybe. <laughs> Please go ahead and smash that subscribe button, like button. It helps us out. Hey, thank you so much, team, and we'll catch you next time. Thank you very much. See you later.